Hello, everybody. Thank you and welcome to the last presentation of the Maryland Virtual Art Summit on Friday afternoon at 5 p.m. Thank you so much for joining us today for Flash, a DIY approach to lighting in the public realm. I'd like to welcome Meryl Hambleton from the Neighborhood Design Center and Glenn Shrum from Flux Studio. Thank you all so much for tuning in today. Meryl, could you go to the next slide? So a practice we've been beginning every session with is a basic land acknowledgement. And a land acknowledgement is a simple and powerful way of showing respect and a step towards correcting the stories and practices that erase indigenous people's history and culture and toward inviting and honoring the truth. Next slide. Every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contributed their energy to making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will, some were drawn to leave their distant homes in hope of a better life, and some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. We acknowledge that we are standing on ancestral lands and we honor the thousands of enslaved Africans whose lives were physically and spiritually stolen. Um, I also want to point out that uh, we encourage you to interact with us during this session. Uh, Marilyn Glenn will present, and there is a button at the bottom to ask questions as well as the chat bar on the right. Uh, please feel free to um, place questions and comments there, and then I will address those at the end. Um, and I think we're ready to begin. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, Hi everyone, I'm Meryl Hambleton from the Neighborhood Design Center uh, and I'm the project manager for Signal Station North. And today uh, my collaborator Glenn Shrum from Flux Studio and I will be sharing a public space activation called Flash that we produced in November of 2019. And I'm gonna give you some background and context on the project and then we'll take you through what we did uh, all of the logistics that allowed us to make it happen and what the outcomes of, of the event were. Um, so just to begin, I'll give you a little bit of context for the project. Uh, the Neighborhood Design Center where I work is a nonprofit that supports community-led projects in the built environment. Um, community groups typically come to NDC with an idea for a project in their place. So it might be a lot, a park, a streetscape, or a schoolyard. And we provide pro bono design services and design documents to support implementation from single plot scale all the way up to master plans. Um, and NDC has been working in Baltimore City for more than 50 years. And over the course of that long history of attending community meetings, we had heard over and over again from people that poor quality lighting in the public realm was a point of concern but we'd never had a community group come to NDC with the project focused specifically on lighting. So last year we thought we would uh, try to address this issue and we got together with MICA, the Central Baltimore Partnership, the Station North Arts and Entertainment District, the Charles North Community Association, and some other local stakeholders to put in a proposal uh, for a project centered around planning for lighting in the public realm. And we got a significant grant from the National Endowment for the Arts uh, th through their Our Town grant making program, which is centered on creative placemaking. And in, with the support of a match from the Central Baltimore Partnership, we were able to move the project forward. And because the Our Town program is creative placemaking based, Signal is not just about sort of cut and dry planning around lighting in the public realm. Uh, it's also about partnering with artists, designers, and residents to try to develop creative approaches to lighting and to get people excited and educated about how lighting investments can help activate public space. So in that spirit, we wanted to kick Signal off with a really fun community-driven event that highlighted the social and transformative power of light. Uh, Brilliant Baltimore in 2019 seemed like uh, the perfect opportunity to do this. So with the support of a Neighborhood Lights grant, um, we collaborated with Flux Studio to put together Flash. Uh, and a brief summary of what Flash was, um, was uh, we got a few, 
a little more than 40 volunteers from the design community and the neighborhood and people throughout Station North to join us for an evening uh, of lighting up sites throughout the district. So armed with flashlights and uh, supported by a little musical accompaniment, we marched through Station North uh, and lit up buildings, public spaces, and parks with just with flashlights to illustrate how much impact uh, well-designed lighting can have. Um, and now I'm going to uh, pass it on to Glenn to tell you a little bit more about the history of this project. Oops, hold on a second. Thanks, Meryl. Let me just get this set. All right, great. Um, is that full screen for everybody? Very good. Um, okay, thanks a lot, Meryl. And um, thanks, Ryan, also for giving us an opportunity to share this project with, um, with uh, the attendees today. Um, we're really excited about um, what Flash did for the community and how it kicked off this larger project, Signal Station North, as Meryl mentioned. Um, and I'm going to go into a bit more detail of um, what we did that night and then later on in the presentation go into more detail of how we how we did it from a lighting design perspective. Um, before I do that, I wanted to talk a bit about or introduce Flux Studio. Um, we are a lighting design firm um, that has a transdisciplinary sort of perspective. So we have artists, architects, um, engineers and uh, people with theatrical designers with theatrical background all working around this topic of light. Um, we typically do projects in the public realm, um, but this is a unique project for us in that it um, involved the collaboration with the Neighborhood Design Center and um, very close community involvement. Um, this project in particular, um, the flash format is one that we did not invent. It's um, some colleagues of mine in the UK started a program they called Gorilla Lighting um, in 2007. And they had sim similar goals to what we were looking for in this event, um, which was to have a use a low cost method to have a high impact on demonstrating how well-designed urban lighting um, can transform public spaces. And really to, to do this through engagement, um, community engagement and hands-on activity. So um, these colleagues of mine, Light Collective, have done guerrilla lighting programs all around the world. And as far as we know, this is the first time one had been done in the US. Um, I should mention that um, guerrillalighting.net and the, the screenshot that you see from that website on the left has free information, open source information about how to do events like this. Um, we learned a lot through this program, um, having not done it before, but um, the, the basic roadmap to how to do an event like this was established um, and we followed it. Um, so uh, the way the night went was that we, um, we started by having um, the organizers, um, NDC and Flux Studio, and then a group of team leaders, and I'll elaborate on the team leaders' roles later. Um, we all convened um, at a space, specifically the North Avenue Market, before um, any volunteers showed up um, to brief on, to have a briefing on the details of where everything stood and um, and sort of plan for the day. We also brought all the equipment that we were going to hand out to the volunteers to that site, um, and then the volunteers. Uh, um, showed up. We had a, as, as um, Meryl had mentioned, the Neighborhood Design Center coordinated all the volunteers. So we communicated to them that they all needed to show up at this site at a specific time. And they knew that they were going to be working with light to activate space, but there really wasn't a lot of detail for them about what exactly they would be doing. So once everyone arrived, um, we gave them all flashlights and we gave them a colored light stick um, and then we had everybody sort of gather until we had the full group. Um, once we had the full group, we um, kicked off the event by having Merrill describe Neighborhood Design Center in a, in a bit. And then I talked a bit about what we were going to be doing for the night. And then in, um, so introduced what we would do as, a, as a e what the evening was going to be and um, divided everyone into groups and each group had a team leader that the volunteers met with initially um, 
it, so after this initial meeting where they were briefed on what would happen, we headed out on the street. So what you see on the screen right now is a map of our walking route. So we started over here. Um, you're, you're looking at um, North Avenue, the middle of, of Station North Arts District, um, running right to left on this image. So we headed down North Avenue and then south on St. Paul Street to our first site. Um, and what I'm in this part of the presentation, I'm going to just highlight the before and after images, not in a little bit about what happened in the way of the process. But this was our first site. So this is the before image before we did anything. Um, it was taken by a professional photographer. At each um, site, we had the same photographer set up at a predetermined location. Um, and so they they documented the site before the, the, the flashlighters involved, all the volunteers um, or arrived, um, and then documented what we did, um, how we transformed the site through this temporary lighting change. Um, and I'm gonna, as I go through these images, toggle the before and after just so you can have a sense of what this transformation was. Um, so at each site, the, the team leaders directed the volunteers to go to specific locations and set up their flashlights in specific ways and aim them in specific ways. Um, but we directed the volunteers to not have all the flashlights on as they walked between sites or while they were on site, except for when they were verifying how everything was set up. Um, one important consideration here is that the flashlights have a finite battery life. So you need one issue is that you want to make sure that there's no um, kind of loss of light over the duration of the event that would impact the later sites. Um, but you can see in this image the the impact that we had. Um, the, the lights are all on, the flashlights are all on for a very limited period of time, just long enough for the photographer to take the before after image and then for um, the visitors that go along with the event or find us along the way to enjoy and understand what that experience is. Um, but the overall time frame of the of the whole walk, the whole um, flashlighting event was less than an hour and a half. Um, so we walked um, back up St. Paul Street from that park, which was at St. Paul, is at St. Paul and Lafayette, to a pretty familiar place to um, those of us that spend time in the Station North Arts District in its North Avenue, um, which you one thing you'll note from this image is it's a pretty exceptional moment on North Avenue when there are so few cars within the view. Um, and the site that we used here was actually this, this large median that's in the middle of North Avenue. So all the volunteers lined up in um, specific locations on the median. Um, I should say that one of the ways we manage where everyone would stand is that we used spray chalk on the ground um, to mark the color, the location of, the, of someone from each of the different teams to stand. Um, and in this site, we weren't lighting an architectural surface or a landscape surface. Instead, what we were doing was really more like a long exposure light painting um, to represent the potential for there to be some interest in this otherwise non-space in the middle of North Avenue. Um, and the photographer got a series of different um, exposures that had different effects. Um, this was a lot of fun. This was the this was the one one site where the volunteers really didn't have any sense what they were at contributing to because it was really all being constructed within the lens of the camera. Then we move to our next site. This is a, a historic church, Seventh Baptist Church at the intersection of North Avenue and St. Paul Street. Um, it's an incredibly grand piece of architecture, but one that's um, been uh, falling into disrepair and sort of underutilized. Um, so it was a space, it was a building that we were particularly excited about demonstrating what it could be with a lighting scheme. Um, we had the benefit of some really great texture to highlight um, and, uh, and some architectural features that allowed us to do a composition of light and shadow that was really intentional. And this was um, probably the biggest transformation, and I'll go into this in a bit more detail later, but the, the re reason that it was able to be the biggest transformation is how dark it was before we did our work. Um, the North Avenue corridor and other areas within Station North are getting um, LED or light emitting diode um, 
updates to the street lighting and it's resulting in a lot of stray light hitting buildings from the um, municipal lighting system but this one area doesn't have a lot of that light which typically isn't a good thing but in this case was very much a good thing and then our last site was the north avenue market so this was also where we started so we we did a loop back to the same location um the north avenue market's a um a commercial space that has um, an increasing activity. Uh, and it was a great opportunity for us to highlight a really familiar building to everyone with a lighting transformation. Um, in this case, we used a, a bit more, had a little more dramatic use of color. Um, and one of the reasons for that was that the building had a lot of light on it before we started. So to be able to demonstrate a change in a sort of designed impact, um, we thought that color would help us with that effect. And with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Meryl to um, talk a bit more about some of the um, aspects of the event that were not specific to the lighting. Thanks, Bob. So, yeah, as Glenn, uh, as Glenn mentioned, um, the, the purpose of the event was not just to demonstrate the impact of light but also to create a sort of moment for our volunteers and for our spectators and for people in the surrounding community um and since we had to walk through the district sort of on mass um we thought it might be fun to kind of turn it into a little bit of a parade um and to do that we we drew on the, the second line culture of new orleans and we hired this incredible local brass band sacole to march and play alongside us as we move from site to site. And uh, you can see uh, one of the band members here on the right. Um, the band was really wonderful and I think it really just transformed the night from a spectacle into a real party. Um, I'm gonna try to play a, a little video of the band. Um, hopefully it won't be too loud. <laughs> Uh, and the other nice thing about the band is that uh, there were some sort of transitional moments when we were getting organized to actually light a building and uh, spectators were kind of standing around waiting. And so the band sort of helped fill the space there as well and entertain our spectators in a very sweet way. <laughs> I don't know if you all are familiar with Baby Shark, but uh, very popular with the toddlers who are watching the night. Um, yeah, we and we even had um, we had one mother and son duo who were driving down North Avenue and heard the music and actually pulled their car over and parked and joined the parade and joined the rest of the event, um, which really felt like uh, a sign that we had uh, done something that people were responding to. Um, our final stop um, after the last lighting site was the Why Not lot, which you can see in this image here. Um, it's a public event space in Station North, and we welcomed volunteers and spectators and anyone who was out and about that night to join us uh, for a gathering afterward. And we had hot cider and tamales from Cocina Luchadores and more music from Saco Lay. Um, and we also were able to set up a screen where we projected before and after images of all of the four sites so that the volunteers could see the immediate impact of their work. And that was really fun. Um, and then in addition to um, sort of hanging out and having a fun night, we also wanted to reconnect this evening back to the larger goals of Signal Station North. So. Uh, we partnered with MICA student and France Merrick fellow Ruby Waldo to create a community listening, listening activity that was centered around light. And she uh, set up this beautiful booth with um, printed out prompts um, to get people thinking about light and how they respond to light. And um, it was really our first chance to hear directly from people in the district. Um, what their thoughts and feelings are about light. So that was really 
successful and interesting as well. Um, obviously, you know, we felt really good about how the night went. And I think from an outside perspective, uh, it went relatively smoothly, but lots of uh, logistical work went into kind of pulling it off. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the sort of um, back end of things, the messy back end of things, um, the sort of how we did a piece. So as Glenn mentioned, um, one of the biggest hurdles was getting 40 volunteers to sign up to walk around uh, Station North at night in November. Um, and I was really concerned that we wouldn't be able to find uh, 40 people who were game for that. And we also wanted to strike a balance between having enough people that if folks dropped off, we could still make it happen, but not so many that we had people with nothing to do. Um, and Maura Dwyer, my colleague from NDC, did a really amazing job uh, communicating with and, and signing up volunteers to, to make that happen successfully. Um, so yeah, I was I was pretty stressed out that people were going to be cold or bored or confused and generally not have a good time. But in the end, um, the the teams showed up in force, and we had plenty of people there to fill the roles. And uh, as Glenn mentioned before, we had the group of volunteers broken up into four teams, and we had wonderful team leaders: Maura Dwyer, Ben Durlin. David Lapidus and Jack Dana, who not only helped train and usher their volunteer groups through the whole process, but generally just kind of served as ambassadors for the project and kept the energy up and, and really made it fun and flawless. Um, and amazingly, the weather was mild and clear. Uh, the awkward moments were, were very few. And I think people had a great time. Um, one other piece of the, the sort of pulling this together was making sure that we reached out to all of our uh, host sites. So we wanted to make sure all of the buildings that we were lighting and the spaces we were lighting, we weren't gonna be surprising the building owners. And um, in some cases that was uh, really easy, especially with uh, Michael Schechter who owns North Avenue Market. Uh, he not only agreed to be one of the sites that we lit, but he also offered to host our pre-event training and serve as a gathering space for volunteers, which turned out to be really crucial because as people were arriving, it took a long time to check everybody in, to distribute flashlights and glow sticks and gel kits. And instead of just sort of milling around outside in the cold, people were, you can see the space in this picture that I have up on the screen now, um, people were able to, uh, hang out, play video games, and drink milkshakes. Um, and this is one of our volunteers, Jack Dana, who was a wonderful uh, ambassador for the project. Um, oops, sorry. And as I mentioned, uh, you know, again, the band was just a critical part of um, just knitting everything together, making it feel like a cohesive event. And then finally, Back at the Why Not Lot, uh, Cocina Luchadores delivered 200 tamales and churros to the site for guests to snack on. And the NDC team, staff and board were there serving hot cider and um, serving all the food. And we had a fire pit and it was just generally a really fun evening. Um, I'm going to pass it back to Glenn now to talk through some of the more logistical and design logistics of what went into the event. All right, I'm just sharing my screen. Great, can you see it? Yeah. Very good. Um, okay, um, thanks again, Meryl. So it really was a great night. Um, I have to say of all the um, different things I've done in lighting design over the years, there were some moments within this night that felt as um, gratifying and important as anything I've ever done. Um, to be connecting with the with the community that the lighting is for and to have people get so excited about the potential of it and really genuinely be interested in um, something that, as I mentioned, is often kind of overlooked as contributing, even though we really do believe that it has a big, it does contribute in a big way to, um, effective places um it was great and the band was not um was a big part of that they just created a, a setting that made everybody um so happy to be spending a, a chilly but not too cold november night together so um there was uh as with all lighting design if we do it well um it looks effortless um and people only notice lighting when it's poor 
Um, with that said, there was a lot of technical and organization. There were a lot of technical and organizational efforts that we had to do in addition to planning the lighting design approach. And we took some of the similar processes to what we do in lighting design all the time um, in that process with with some. A, some different processes because of the nature of this event. But one thing we do all the time is detailed planning and iterations. And so I'm gonna be talking about the um, iterations around a few different key issues um, in this part of the presentation. So the first was site selection. And this was very, very important on lots of levels. I already touched on the importance of proximity between the sites, um, our ability to move the group size around the city within the specified time frame was completely contingent on thinking about how we were going to be able to do that um, based on specific traffic patterns and things like that. Um, but we also <clears throat> um, had an intention of the site locations being informed by the Signal Station North project plan insofar as we knew what that plan would involve so early in the, in the stage, in this stage of the project. One thing we knew is that we wanted to highlight different types of spaces. So we picked um, uh, public building, uh, more historic buildings, and then we had the, the um, park. Um, we had one of the murals, which is a feature of the Station North community. Um, and then the last thing that I also alluded to earlier was to look at the nighttime conditions. So here you see a comparison um, before, actually it looks like my mouse is gonna cause that to pop up. On the um, North Avenue market, the nighttime condition was quite bright, whereas at Seventh Baptist Church, we didn't have much ambient light. Um, this is a, a couple of views of iterations of the route maps that we did over time. This There was a third version that we ended up with here. Um, so we were looking not only at the sites, but how we would get there, what path we would take. Um, and we did mock-ups, um, which is something that um, Flux Studio's process involves regardless of what type of project we do. But it, it was especially important on this project because um, we didn't have detailed drawings. We didn't do our typical process that uses computer simulation to understand lighting performance. Um, but uh, so what we did instead was really just go out in the, in the district with the flashlights. Um, and first we had to test the flashlights to even find out which flashlights we would use. And then we had to understand their performance relative to our intent. So one thing we looked at was the distribution of light. So that's the composition of light in shadow, um, both on an individual surface and then brought more broadly across the whole project or building. Um, we looked at fixture position, how close to the surface would we be with the fixtures and then how would that lead to uh, awareness of the texture, which sometimes is a good thing and sometimes is a bad thing. Um, and then we looked at color um, different colors. We have, there are lots of different colors that you can choose and that are available, but we had to look at what worked together with other colors in the environment. Um, and also how dense the color became before it started to reduce the light output. Um, and then on the logistical side, once we knew what we wanted to light on the building, we had to figure out where each person would stand and what each team leader would do in terms of managing those people, how we would we had, with a special um, sort of emphasis on having the team leaders not have to understand too many different conditions. So we try to have the same team leader talk to have every, people from their team do the same condition across the whole building. Um, and we had to reconcile that with the quantity of volunteers. Um, this was probably one of the most challenging things. Um, and Merrill mentioned the challenge of understanding how many volunteers we had and not having too many and not having too few it had direct implications to what we could light on the building. So there was a point where if we had too few people, we just weren't gonna be able to accomplish the, the lighting approach that we had mapped out. Um, so there was a lot of back and forth about that as the quantity of volunteers sort of shifted around. Um, and we generated spreadsheets to keep track of, of all these numbers of how many um, fixtures we have, how many columns we had, how many windows we had. Um, and then there were the flashlights, a lot of flashlights. Um, we purchased all rechargeable flashlights. That was of course great because we weren't um, running through batteries that we had to dispose of. But it, the challenge with that was that we had to have them all fully charged for the event. 
Um, so 40 flashlights in sequence getting charged and then keeping track of which ones were charged and which ones weren't so that we didn't end up with um, one losing its output during the event. Um, we cut the specific color gels that we used. We tried to use the same color on more than one site where possible, but we ended up with a fair amount of variation. Um, and then we also had some other optical accessories that were lenses to take a more narrow beam of light and turn it into a broader beam of light, soften it basically, um, so that we could light larger building areas with the same fixture. Um, and then the day of the event, flashlights are all charged, the color gels are all put into packs, the team, for each team leader, the team leader instructions have all the information that they need. We double and triple check all those quantities, and then we organized each one of these bins around each team so that when the volunteers came in, we could give them what they needed, and when the team leaders arrived, we could give them what they needed. Um, and we used light sticks um, to help to keep track of who was in which team. So our team colors were directly related to the light stick that we distributed to the team volunteer member. Um, this was really helpful um, at during the event because it allowed us to understand who was in what team. I mean, one of the challenges when you're working with this many people is to understand, um, you don't obviously know who every individual person is within this compressed time frame, um, or what role they have. So this, the, the light sticks were, were really helpful and they were fun to have as well. Um, so this is a, a couple of examples of the team leader instructions that we distributed. Um, so we gave, we went out and took daytime photos of where um, all of the, um, volunteers should be located and and then did written instructions of where they should be aiming the light and what accessories they would have. Um, so the team leaders had these notes to help them to keep track of what was expected. Um, and then in the briefing meeting, um, it was really where it all sort of came together. Um, and not the least of which was because of the, the um, great job that our team leaders did at uh, none of whom had lighting design background when we started this project. So um, they all did a good job of getting up to speed on the lighting design requirements really quickly and an even better job at making sure everybody had fun. Um, so this is a, a, from our walking to our first site. Um, I just have some images in here of um, more sort of action shots from the, from the event. So you can see everybody's light sticks helping to keep track because of course, as soon as we left the briefing, everybody separated from their groups. Um, this is at the first site where we have the volunteers. We, we did ask that everyone wear dark clothes just so that in the photography, um, it, they wouldn't be as visible um, in the before and after images. Um, and then in this case, we directed um, the volunteers to sit where they were blocking a view of the light source. Um, which helped to avoid a, a glare in the camera's view. And one great thing about this event is that it provided an opportunity to describe some of the subtlety that makes a difference in lighting design applications. So um, as we went to each site and all the volunteers were in place and they were aiming roughly where their light roughly where we, we had suggested they would, we, I, we were going around and talking to them about, well, if you, if you try to, glance that surface a little bit more, it'll make the texture more like the person that's aiming the light below on the surface below, or details like that that were able to be described through hands-on um, exercise. So it really did meet some of the goals of the Signal Station North project where educating the community about the impact lighting can have and how to accomplish it on their own um, came through. Um, this was at the median, obviously, and this was the one location that was the hardest to sort of communicate. Um, and it's recommended by the guerrilla lighting organizers that um, we would use, you'd have a megaphone, which um, we had intended to have, but ended up for a variety of reasons, it didn't come together. So um, amidst North Avenue traffic, um, I was screaming across the street to try to get everybody to do things that were not at all as defined as every other site. And so it was the most complicated site for them to not be able to hear and the site where they could not hear. <laughs> so. Um, it worked out in the end and everybody was good sports, but I think it was a good thing. This was the second site instead of the last site. I think we might've lost, uh, lost some enthusiasm. I think uh, I bought the wrong size batteries for the bullhorn. Um, well, we got, we, we went out and did two more battery runs right, right. before. So yeah, <laughs> I, to this day, I think it just wasn't meant to be. 
Um, <laughs> but really, everybody had a great time, um, and I think didn't in many cases didn't know what to expect from a nighttime event where they would be doing something with lighting design, um, other than sort of looking at a lighting design that someone else created. Um, but it, it really was a success. Um, and then I have this last image that just shows, again, the before after transformation. Um, and the church, as I mentioned, was probably the most dramatic. Um, and where we attracted the most attention is our third site. And back to Merrill. So um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the uh, the impact of, of the work uh, of the evening. Um, first of all, I think just on a basic level, people enjoyed it and had a good time. People were talking about the project. Um, we got a, a really nice write up in, the, in Baltimore Magazine um, talking about it sort of served the purpose that we wanted to serve, which is that it uh, announced Signal Station North to the world. and um, did it in a fun, engaging way. Um, but but I think more than that, um, one of the, the most critical outcomes was, um, as I mentioned, we had that community listening station that uh, Ruby Waldo, our fellow from MICA, led, um, where she was able to actually start talking to people about their impressions around light and uh, prompting people to think and consider light. Um, and, and you can see on the screen, I've um, put up some scans of uh, some of the reflections that people shared. Um, and that's really informed um, the, the project since, since the event, where we've been doing a really intensive process of listening to community members to try to understand what their experience of light in the district is and what they want and need from more lighting investment. Um, and Ruby's actually taken some of the feedback from, from this evening and incorporated it into a, a zine that's gonna accompany the plan. Um, and you can see a couple of pages from it here, um, which is really just kind of picking up the more um, kind of big picture, like thoughtful, enjoyable elements of the project, um, getting people to stop and consider lighting in the public realm in a way that they don't normally. And, um, you know, she picks up on some of the threads that came out of that original event at Flash um, and um, offers some really interesting prompts, um, like to, to go stand near a light post and consider its posture or uh, to, to think about, um, how tall you are in comparison to the lighting or to think about um, what you can do in a well-lit space versus a less well-lit space. So I think that's been a really wonderful outcome of the, um, of the flash event. And then just, you know, to come back to the kind of core of what NDC's work is about and what the signal project is ultimately about. I think we created a really, wonderful, fun experience for people in the arts district. And everyone who came out had a really good time. And I think it was just surprising and unexpected and um, just got people thinking in a new way about um, how light impacts their experience of space. So hopefully we can carry that forward through the rest of the project. And that's all. Thank you so much, everyone who's watching. It's we can't see you, so it's it, hi. But um, great to great to share the project. Yes, thanks, everybody. Okay, thank you guys so much. That was such a wonderful, thorough review of both the um, impact that I think this awesome project had, but all the work that had to go into preparing and thinking through not only the experience, but um, um, what the outcome was supposed to be. And as someone who was there and participated, I was fortunate enough to be, it was so neat that it, it felt like as a participant, it really felt like you were um, almost a part of some kind of physical photography because we were doing activities that then 
we would see the result of later in this awesome documentation you're showing. And so it was like a, waiting for a Polaroid to develop or something. Uh, it's pretty amazing to see how you guys um, both engaged us then and then with the results. Um, we have some questions, and I think one of the, the most interesting and relevant right now is from Anne, who is wondering if you have thoughts about how these elements and methods, um, and I think the, the projection in general can lend itself to the, the COVID limitations and how it might be adaptable. And I'll also ask if, if Meryl, I don't know if you can speak at all about the um, design for distancing program that NBC is involved with in relation to that. Sure, definitely. Glenn, do you want to take the first half of it and I'll jump in? Um, I don't have any easy answers. Um, I have to say that so much of, of the the structure of this event, it has to do with um, sort of hands-on, literally. So the, the, the distribution of the equipment is problematic and the interaction on the site is, is something you'd have to figure out. I, I feel like um, another thing that's a, another important consideration is that what we found through our testing was that you'd need a critical mass of flashlights to have an impact in the urban environment. So my initial reaction is you could never take on a building of the scale of Seventh Baptist Church with a group that would be any smaller than we had. But I do think that you could have an impact on, on smaller buildings or smaller sites. Um, but I think it's important to, to note that, um, you know, when you're working at an urban scale, it, it's, it sometimes requires a real sort of quantity of light sources to have an impact um, over large surfaces. But um, with that said, I don't, I, it's more that I just don't have an idea in mind exactly how it would be different because it was so structured around not having those limitations. But um, we are already thinking about how the hands-on nature of, of having these very simple basic tools, flashlights, um, in the hands of, of people that are not lighting designers can help them to really understand the power of light. So we've talked about with the Signal Station North project, whether or not it may be possible to distribute flashlights um, for members of the community to have for a limited period of time with some instructions about how to do experimentation with them so they can learn hands-on. Um, but it's it, it obviously has a lot of other logistical problems that are different than what we just sorted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that um, one of the the pieces of of the flash event that maybe could be um, relevant right now was I think walking distantly together. I think that that part of the project felt really critical. Like I think that the lighting just on its own, if we just arrived at these spaces without walking together, might not have had the same feeling. Um, and as I, as we've both mentioned a lot, like the band going with us, um, and it's something that we've been thinking about. Um, we had originally planned to do some community walks um, as part of the Signal project, um, led by Glenn, to just kind of walk through the district and observe the light that's there. Um, and I think that's something that we may still be able to do in a safe way. So, um, kind of bringing that like walking through space as a distantly gathered group um, feels feels still relevant, I think. Um, and then just to quickly to, uh, to address your second question, Ryan, um, you mentioned the Design for Distancing project, and that's something that uh, NDC is working on in collaboration with the mayor's office and with the Baltimore Development Corporation. Um, and uh, it's an effort to tap the design community to help us rethink strategies for how we can gather safely in public spaces. So obviously um, everybody's working on the, the project right now of how businesses can safely open. Um, and what we're thinking about specifically with this project is how can we reclaim parts of the public realm to, to serve that purpose? And we're, we actually just launched the um, the first call for concept sketches today. So, if anyone I just posted it in the chat box. Oh, great! Oh, great! And the deadline is June third. Yeah, so it's a really quick turnaround, um, but it's uh, the requirements for the first round um, are are not too demanding. It's just basically a sketch with some supporting images and a description of the project, but. 
Um, we're looking for really innovative, creative ideas about how to gather safely in public spaces in the city. So uh, if you are an artist or a designer um, or someone who's just design minded, um, please submit your ideas. Um, we're gonna be choosing, uh, choosing them at the end of next week and we'll actually be handing out stipends to all of the awarded um, ideas. So it's a great opportunity for anyone who wants to, to give it a shot. And also, I should also mention that in addition to the concept sketches, we're going to be actually implementing um, about 17 of these projects in public sites throughout all the city. So not only will you get some interesting ideas on how to address these issues, we're actually going to be uh, investing in, in Baltimore neighborhoods and, and activating some public spaces for this purpose. Yeah, and I, I wanted to address one of the comments about um, that maybe the role of light in memorial being relevant in the time of COVID. I, I mean, I don't, I believe that light is n never been more relevant in terms of where we are now. So certainly in memorial, but also in terms of, um, I think one of the ways that our use of space is going to change is that we're going to start to think about time as part of the equation. So how do we extend the use of spaces over longer periods of time so mm -hmm. more people can benefit from them without having a density of use at any given time? And right. and one thing about lighting, especially in the urban environment, is that there are areas, big areas of the city that have locations that are very actively used during daylight hours and not used at nighttime. Um, I mean, one prime example would be a lot of playgrounds, for example, that um, in areas um, that are further north or further south than us um, that get a bigger s swing of nighttime length in the winter, that's something that they really actively pursue is that how do they make sure that those urban amenities are useful to people in the winter months? And I, I think those kinds of conversations are going to become rele more relevant in the, the time of COVID as well. That's a really strong point. As, and I, I even think the technology allows for um, we've seen technology uh, and projection technology kind of open up the sphere of more artists using that. Mm -hmm. And I think of like the luminous interventions um, mm -hmm. protests around the city and their pipelines project at the first light city where they turned the McKeldon fountain into a memorial for projection mapping. And um, there are, um, I'm so sorry not to know the artist's name, but there's an artist who's been doing interventions of projecting um, short obituaries and memorials in DC and that's not, I don't think, as thoughtful in terms of the environmental lighting that Glenn was talking about, but just the use of being able to, to shoot over a distance, um, the accessibility of that. Um, any other questions? Uh, so there's a few more questions. I think you really d described a lot about the rehearsals and um, um, your process, but any anything else? Maybe if you were going to do it again, you know, lessons learned about that. Um, or another question about site too is, is um, you know, you talked about maybe how you selected the sites, but how much did you have to work with the site owners? I think you mentioned one of the property owners. Yeah, um, I am trying to remember now exactly how we selected the sites, and maybe I'll let you um, chime in on that, Glenn, because I somehow like really can't remember how we narrowed it down other than that we had some basic typologies. Like we knew we wanted to light some buildings. We thought it would be interesting to light a public space. Um, and the median became kind of like a possible site where, where an art intervention might be more meaningful. Um, and yeah, do you want to add anything to that? Glenn? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, so for sure we, we were looking at um, having a range of different types of sites. And as even in the early days of the Signal project, we were looking for um, locations that where we could demonstrate through this project that a lighting transformation could be impactful. And this is one of the big challenges when as lighting designers is that um, it's a bit easier to imagine how a change in the use of a building would change a neighborhood than it is to understand how mm -hmm. adding this kind of immaterial element of light to a building could change the neighborhood. So the the um, Seventh Baptist Church is a, a really good example where from the very beginning of the project, we identified this is a huge resource. This is the potential to be a huge 
resource and very valuable to this community that they have this amazing architectural ob, um, building in their context. But right now you can be waiting for a bus right outside of that building and never look up at night and not even think about it as being a special place. So we did look for those. Um, and then we were also the, the logistics of, of like, for example, in North Avenue Market, having Michael Schechter support so that we could go up into the cupolas to do lighting in the cupolas. Um, that was something that there were other buildings that we might have considered that without having a friendly building owner, um, that would have never been an option. So um, yeah, I think also one of the considerations was the logistics of the actual walk. Like we, something that I was, as I mentioned, nervous about throughout was just, maybe it's because I get cold easily, but I was like, oh, people aren't gonna wanna be outside for more than like 30 minutes. So trying to, as Glenn said, address those different types of spaces while also like creating a route that wasn't too long or too short. Um, and I feel like we kind of, we kind of nailed it on that one. It felt, and maybe it was just because it was a mild night. It wasn't too bad, but, um, you know, it felt like we saw a diversity of places and like we actually were moving through the district to some extent, but we also weren't, you know, dragging people around, um, indefinitely. Yeah, there were, um, I mean, there were some sites that I think could have been, um, equally impactful. I mean, um, Graffiti Alley comes to mind as one that if we could have done a really great job of lighting some of the these wall surfaces that are so activated with color that it would have been very transformative, but it was the opposite direction. Like the, the, the proximity and the, the, the sort of organization of the way the run of the night would go ended up being a really important factor as well. Um, and the North Avenue median was one that, um, we identified pretty early on because it's a space that I think many people don't even recognize as the potential to be a place of value. Um, and so we wanted to try to show that with this prod, this so that we could make it a part of the signal station North plans too. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, all right, here's one more question that a lot of people are, you know, we may be thinking about this additional lighting but I think you, you just touched on it briefly in the presentation, but I know you have thoughts on just the street lighting and the transition of street lighting. You know, how can arts administrators, um, A&E district managers or um, community members advocate for more humane street lighting? Well, um, I'll jump in on this one, Meryl. So this is something right, that, yeah. that um, has been a big part of what we've been looking at with the um, signal project as we've been doing an analysis of lighting conditions. Um, we are critical of the existing street lighting that's been, or the, the new street lighting that's been installed. It's much higher light levels than are recommended. And it also makes it quite hard to do um, accent lighting on it, within the area because it's so bright that the accent lighting would have to be brighter. I mean, it's it's not as bad as a Times Square, but imagine a single light bulb in Times Square, you'd never know that it was turned on, right? And it's all just because of the, the context of light is so high. So, um, so we're gonna be putting together some thoughts about that as a part of the Signal Station North plan that we are specifically doing with an eye to it being relevant to other arts districts and parts of neighborhoods and parts of the city um, just for a way to engage in the conversation about the municipal lighting so it doesn't just happen. It's something that you are mindfully aware of, you know, and participate in what that outcome would be or potentially changing what that outcome is, which is another story, I guess. That's excellent. That might be relevant across the state um, and nationally as well. So um, I, I think that's addressed all the questions and comments. I know it's... Um, we're not quite at six, but if it is Friday night, so maybe we let class out seven minutes early. <laughs> Any, anyone else want to want to ask a question, or if um, if not, I think you guys were just great. Thank you. So, oh, what was the budget of that project? Of of uh, uh, the budget of the project was, I think it ended up coming in about seven grand, um, and that was. Um, Everything, including the purchase of the flashlights to the food, to paying the band and- um, So it was- Donated 
Yeah, it was material cost. Um, yeah. So we had the good fortune of of it being tied to the signal project in terms of the you know the time that we all spent. And um, right. but yeah, and it, one thing that Marilyn and I were talking about before the call, we had to start from scratch by uh, purchasing the flashlights. Um, right. And our our my colleagues in the UK have used the same inventory of flashlights when they've traveled around to do this. Um, but the good news is. Um, the neighborhood design center now has a lot of flashlights. So if it's something that other communities or, or people are interested in, I think, um, you know, we would love to share what we learned and potentially the materials too. Chris. Yeah, I think that's, if anybody on this call is interested in doing it, I, I was going to say, I think there is something really powerful about um, actually putting that power to transform space into people's hands. I think it really changes your perception around how things in the built environment happen. Um, and seeing that even a very uh, relatively low cost intervention can just completely change how you understand and see a space is, is dramatic. So we encourage more projects like this. Well, we hope we'll see more too. So thank you both so much and have a great weekend. And thanks everybody who tuned in and tuned in throughout the whole Maryland Virtual Art Summit this week. We really appreciate it. Thanks everyone. Thanks, thanks everyone. Friends.